there's one place in Japan that speaks volumes about culture and history and tradition, it's here. It's one of my absolute favourite places in this whole country. I'm here in Kyoto. This time, I spend the morning with a tea master. And play drinking games with a micro. There's pickles, tempura, and the latest in Kyoto cuisine. This is going to take the cake. It's really quite a playful dish. Kyoto plays such a hugely important role in Japanese culture and it's because during the time of the Muromachi period, this was the capital of the country and it was a time of cultural renaissance. The things that we know of Japanese culture today like no theatre and calligraphy and architecture were all being born just all around here. But there's one aspect that brings all of those different parts of Japanese culture together and that's the way of tea. Daitokuji is the spiritual home of Japanese teaism. In the 1500s, this was the Zen training ground of Sen Norikyu, Japan's foremost master in the way of tea. The small doorway to enter the tea room meant no armour, weapons, tools or other accoutrements of status could be carried in. And this ensured that everyone from the highest samurai to the lowest peasant came to tea in the same way. オーストラリアからクラダムさんに何か日本のこの季節の花のイメージのお菓子を食べていただきたいと思って、今日これをはい、もうこれ朝からオーダーメイドでアダムさんのためにお菓子屋さんが作ってくれたんですよ。ありが
the flowers left on the tree at the end of those first blooms when the leaves are taking over and there's just a few flowers left there surrounded by greenery. These two here though, they're really special. They look fantastic and this one is the azaleas with their roots grown into a rock. And when you look at it, that's, that's exactly what you see. You see these flowers and a rock that they're attached to. Behind all this creativity, most fresh wagashi start with a simple white bean paste shido on. White beans are soaked for 12 hours, then drained and boiled in fresh water, skimmed and rinsed three times. Then they're simmered for a further one and a half hours. When the beans are soft, they're mashed and filtered to remove any lumps. Then excess liquid is squeezed out. Finally, caster sugar is added, and the paste is stirred over heat until it's reached a firm consistency. The outer layers are made from nerikiri, the same paste coloured, mixed with rice flour and steamed. And here's where you can explore your inner impressionistic artist. And this one here, this is a banquet of flowers. The idea behind this one is a, a ball of yarn that weaves together the colours of late spring and is the end of the blossom, but also those first green parts of a meadow. And it's very, very clever and it just looks fantastic. Quite lovely. It's very soft and not as sweet as a Western dessert. That bean paste that makes up the major component of this dish is something I've grown up with. So this has a very familiar taste to me. That's soft and it's you feel like you could eat five or six of these, but you know you probably shouldn't. Up heads a restaurant that serves one of the absolute classics of Japanese cuisine. It's a favourite the world over. But what may surprise you is, its origins aren't actually Japanese at all. I'm talking about tempura, which was introduced by the Portuguese Jesuits in the 1500s. It's one of the earliest examples of Japan taking something from another culture, interpreting it, applying painstaking perfectionism and making it their own. And at tempura restaurants such as Kawatatsu, it's a fine culinary art form. I want to show you one thing. These are two identical flowers, but the difference between them is really the secret to a good tempura batter. It's all about the mastery of gluten, the protein that's in all wheat flours. This one here is just regular flour. And you can see as I squeeze it, it clumps together. And that's moisture and protein holding it into that clump. This one is the same flour that's been sifted and then dried in the freezer overnight. You can see as I squeeze that together, the clumps just fall apart. And that means the gluten and the moisture is nowhere near as high as in this version, and that's a secret to a crispy batter. Chef Takuya Namikawa makes his batter by mixing an egg with iced water and then sifting in the flour. But he believes the most important trick to making a great tempura is the temperature of the oil. The way Nanigawa-san checks the oil is really quite incredible. Just flicks a little touch of that tempura batter in and sees how deep it goes into the oil and also the speed at which it comes back up. The faster that it comes back up and the, the shallower it goes into the oil, the hotter the, the temperature is. My favourite tempura accompaniment is simply salt or this green tea and salt mix. But another wonderful tempura dipping sauce is tensuyu, a blend of dashi, sake, mirin and soy that's mixed with grated daikon. These are prawns that have been cut so that they stay straight when they are fried and they don't curl up. And these are the heads. The heads of the prawn with the legs attached to them in that very light tempura batter. And that is just extraordinary. The contrast between the two cuts of the prawn here is really special. It's sweet and light and fluffy on the inside of this prawn meat here, but the head, the head is just salty and crispy. And here's one you may not have heard of. It's eel fillet and spine. <laughs> That's great. That's very nice. The spine of an eel, who would have thought so surprisingly tasty. It's salty and almost like liver in a way. 
I don't know quite how to describe it. It's got that metallic taste of liver, but with the crunchiness of the spine, it's really wonderful. One of Chef Namikawa's specialties is his sweet potato, which he cooks whole rather than sliced. The skin becomes nutty, the, the batter is slightly toastier and browner, but the inside is soft and juicy and incredibly sweet. I think the, the development of the starch into sugar that's happened in that long, slow cooking of the sweet potato, it's fantastic. It's quite amazing, really. You know, the more I travel through Japan, eat different things in every day, every moment. My perception of Japanese cuisine and the way I approach it, the way I taste it and eat it and cook it, is changing. Away from the tourist crowds of Gion, this is Miyagawa Cho, one of Kyoto's most famous geisha districts. Now, if you had to describe what a geisha is, or a geiko as it's called down here in Kyoto, imagine taking a world class ballerina and combining that with a classical musician and a sparkling conversationalist. These are people that have dedicated their entire lives to the pursuit of beauty. Twenty-year-old Fukukimi is a maiko, an apprentice geiko who's now in the final year of her studies. She was just 12 years old when she left her home in the rural north of Japan and travelled to Kyoto to begin her new life under the strict guidance of her tutors. The first year was spent studying speech and etiquette, and since then she's been devoted to the study of the arts. <laughs> Next year, Fukukimi will become a geiko. And for a girl who was born in a small country town, it's a dream come true. It's difficult for Westerners to understand what a geiko or geisha actually does in Japanese society. But whether at a wedding or an important business dinner, they exist solely to provide grace, beauty and elegance to everything they touch. I've been invited to experience something Japanese high society usually pay thousands of dollars for. This is an ozashiki, a geiko party. A geiko or a maiko like Fukukimi-san here is, is here to serve us drinks and to engage in conversation. And these name cards here, almost like business cards, they say that if you put it in your wallet and keep it there, it's going to attract lots of money. These ozashiki have all the elements for an elegant and refined evening, with music, dance, food and drink. But in the pursuit of fun, there's always an opportunity to let your hair down. And so geika are also masters of another age-old art, drinking games. The difficulty with this game is you have to tap the box with either an open hand or you can take the box and then you have to tap the table with a closed fist and if you get it wrong then you're in real trouble the music gets faster and faster see if you try to take it while I was talking to you guys that's sneaky
絶対うんと言わせないそれの目の目ハケハケの目の目ハケハケのお兄さんはお強い<笑><笑> That's the classiest スカオスカオスカオでございますありがとうございます Kyoto is full of history, tradition, and culture, and sometimes you can think it's just an old city. But this restaurant here takes all of that and turns it into something that's very modern and also a little bit fun. Masayasu Yonemura has earned Michelin stars for both his Tokyo and Kyoto restaurants. His culinary style employs Japanese and French techniques, but his inspirations come from the seasons and a desire to entertain. Here's just a taste of what's on the menu right now. First up is a picnic of spring hors d'oeuvres. A daring combination of grilled bamboo shoots with sea urchin and truffles, and a soup of vegetables and sake leaves. Next are clams and turtle custard and a salad of red snapper. And this version of sushi is really something. I've heard of quite a few modern interpretations of sushi before, but this has got to take the cake. It's really quite a playful dish. Masayasu begins by creating a loose risotto. 70% boiled rice is finished off in a small pan with court bouillon. Broad beans are added, then cream. A fillet of eel is steamed, rested, and then blowtorched until well toasted. Foie gras is seared in a hot pan until crisp. And the dish now comes together with the eel being placed over the foie gras and put onto the risotto. It's topped with the red wine veal jus, a sprinkle of sun show pepper. And nori seaweed. The foie gras is lovely and creamy, and it matches perfectly well with that risotto rice and that soft, sort of delicate eel. Yeah, the flavors are incredibly strong, kind of knocks you back a little bit with the richness of it. But in terms of taking a traditional concept and expressing it in a modern way, it's a, it's a lot of fun to eat. There's one thing that's completely underrated in Japanese cuisine is these pickles, a thousand different varieties done a thousand different ways. And Kyoto is the home of pickles. You can spend all day going through the different varieties here. This daikon radish that's been pickled in tamari be a great foil for say a, a simple bowl of rice or something light in flavor because it's quite strong itself. This rakyo, the Japanese onion bulbs, very sweet and go perfectly with Japanese curry. Even here, these little radishes that have been pickled, absolutely stunning. And you talk about the beauty and the elegance and the lightness of Japanese cuisine and it's all here in front of us. In Japan, making tsukemono or Japanese pickles is an everyday part of life. In fact, many homes have their own pickling crocs, which are faithfully tended every day. But if you want to get serious about pickles, this is the place to visit the Uchida Pickle Factory in Kyoto's back streets. And actually, even the phrase pickles is a little bit insubstantial to describe what goes on in a place like this. Here they make about 80 different varieties of pickles, and it's not just pickling, they, they salt and they pickle in vinegar, and they also pickle or ferment in various different kinds of. Medium, so they use miso. Or this here is、uh, half a head of white cabbage or Chinese cabbage fermented underneath rice bran. It's these good bacteria and various fermentation techniques that create such a wonderful variety of flavors and textures. <laughs> the thing about 
this process is it's all hand done, it's handmade, and every daikon's a different shape, it's a different weight, different texture. And so with each batch that comes in, the head pickle maker here will individually look at how much salt each one needs, how much it needs to be pressed. These are all hand cut on board so they can be measured to the right size for the daikon. It's taking somebody's care and intuition for making a product rather than just throwing it through a factory so that everything comes out the same at the end. It's using that art to produce something that's unique every single time. When you visit Kyoto, be sure to give yourself enough time to explore. This is the city where traditional Japanese culture is so beautifully refined. It's always impressive, but never gaudy. Constantly surprising, but never shocking. And when you've been here for a while, you realize that there's no other place in the world quite like Kyoto. I've seen so many different aspects of this wonderful city, so I want to do a dish to me that really says Kyoto. So I'm making a salmon ochazuke with Kyoto pickles. Ochazuke is really a, a rice dish with some toppings on top that could really be anything. And then hot tea is poured around it to make a kind of porridge or soup. The first thing we need to do is salt our salmon. And the idea behind salting like this isn't just to season the fish, it's to draw out some of the moisture and intensify the flavor. So we leave that aside for about an hour. Now, if you want to make a simple Japanese pickle, this is a great way to get started. Place Chinese cabbage, cucumber and carrot into a sealable plastic bag, add strips of kombu and salt, and leave in your fridge for at least half an hour. Here's one I prepared earlier. After 24 hours in the fridge, that's what you'll get. A really nice, simple, fresh asazuke pickle. It's probably time to cook our salmon now. Rather than just taking the skin off after we've cooked it, I'm going to score the skin at regular intervals just so it crisps up nicely. We'll just leave that for a few minutes to go. Skin side down first. The salmon's nice and crispy under there, so turn it over just for a minute or so. Usually salmon for a lot of Japanese dishes, and particularly for ochazuke, is cooked all the way through and that, that dry texture works with an ochazuke because you've got the liquid being poured over it but I prefer to cook it so it's just still slightly gelatinous inside just cooked through we've got a nice crispy skin on it take our salmon out now just try and soak up some of the excess oil and some of this absorbent paper here Ichida Sun's giving me a really beautiful array of colourful pickles here this is a mountain potato that's pickled with a a touch of wasabi and this one this is a, a local Kyoto root vegetable that's been pickled with some sakura leaves cherry blossom leaves so it's slightly pink these are sometimes called breakfast radishes and of course I can't forget about my own pickle as well wasabi is a really great match with salmon so it's going to grate some fresh wasabi as well and I'll place it just next to our pickles there and this here is mitsuba, sometimes called uh, trefoil. It's kind of a halfway between a vegetable and a herb. It's got a really wonderful pungent aroma. It goes really nicely with salmon. Take a few slices of that. The stalks as well as the leaves, they've all got flavor. This is salmon roe. And to dress that, I'll just put a couple of teaspoons of soy sauce and mix that through, give it a light salting. Now it's time to flake up our salmon. Just break that apart with my hands. A lot of Japanese dishes don't really use the skin of the salmon, but I think it works really well. Nuchozuke. Now for the tea. This is sencha. It's a nice high-grade green tea, and I've chosen this because the colour of the green tea and the orange of the salmon will look really nice together, but it's also got a wonderful flavour that will match really well in this ochazuke. And from there we can start to assemble our ochazuke. Top of our portion of rice. Scatter around some of our mitsuba. Over that some toasted sesame seeds. Our rice crackers or kaki. Great texture for this kind of dish. And then our flaked salmon on top of that again. Just a spoon of our dressed salmon roe 
in there. Some finely sliced nori seaweed just to garnish the top. And that's all the dish is really. Salmon ochazuke with Kyoto pickles. Next time, I dive headfirst into the crazy high energy world of Osaka. Down, oh, down, oh. There's sumo, baseball, it really doesn't get any better than this. the world's best blades. I might just put that back before I drop it on my foot. And the fine art of Japanese street food. I have to say, takoyaki is one of my favorites.